G'day everyone, Kate from the Narrate team here. God made us not only to be under authority, but also to possess authority. Adam takes a closer look at the varying styles of authority in the Bible and asks, are we following God in the way we use ours? So some of you are thinking, what does that have to do with anything? Uh, Festivus, we're, we're in this conversation called I Loathe Authority, and it'll be a quick one, but it just seems to perfectly capture not only Christmas and the season we're in, but that part of all of us that, that loathes being told what to do. I think that there's something about the Costanzas and Seinfeld in general that makes it compelling is the fact that they snub their nose at convention and authority and kind of do things their own way, whether it's for their better or not. And last week, if you weren't with us, we, we, we started this conversation called I Love Authority by simply just, first of all, noting or wondering if, if you've recognized in yourself the tendency to dislike or be suspicious of anyone who has the power to tell you what to do. Uh, that it kind of doesn't matter uh, what's happened to you, though we did allow last week that certainly if, if you've been abused by authority, whether that's a parent or uh, a teacher or whether that's physical or emotional or even spiritual abuse, certainly that makes you all the more gun-shy toward authority. But one of the things we wondered is what, what, if, what if, if even all the experiences you've had were, with authority were positive? What if you'd still feel the same way about authority in general? In other words, what if every parent, every teacher, every leader, uh, every pastor, every coach, every principal, every police officer, what if every authority you'd ever interacted with was perfect? Question becomes, would you still feel the same way about authority? And I don't know what you've concluded about the scriptures, but I'm just going to safely, I hope, assume that you're at least intrigued if you're here this morning. And the scriptures weigh in on this in kind of interesting fashion, in my opinion, because the opening chapters of the Bible that they portray God as an authority and yet his authority was perfect. Uh, the assumption is that you have this, we'll call it utopian reality of Adam and Eve in the garden and God's presence is there and they were never taken advantage of, they were never mistreated, they were never abused, they were never yelled at, like no one, God never lifted their hand, like their experience of authority was perfect. And yet still you see them having troubles because the, the fall like that moment when people fell from God's grace, that moment where the serpent and the proverbial fruit and all that happened there it's all made possible by the fact that, that Satan, if you will, the serpent was able to expose that Adam and Eve wondered about the just nature of authority. Like it, it all happens because Adam and Eve were able to go, wait a minute, did God, does he really have our best interests at heart? Is he really good? Can he really be trusted? And that got us thinking like, well, what if? What, what if part of our DNA, part of the way we're made is is we dislike authority. And there are lots of topics in life where we say, hey, this could be either a huge blessing or a huge curse. Most strengths can become either an enormous blessing to the community and to others, or they can become these glaring weaknesses, these very dark things. And really what we're wondering in this series is, what if, what if God made you for authority and how you manage that, how you steward that, what you do with that reality is everything. See, the question we really asked last week is, what, what happens if, if someone's disliking of authority goes unchecked, unmanaged, or even unrealized? And so really last week was a conversation about authority and how we use it, and even more so what our view of being under it really is and, and how that fleshes itself out. And the, the takeaway challenge was just, who, who are the ruthless truth tellers in your life? Who are the people that, that you're agreeing that you know, their wisdom is better than yours, or even positionally, it's in your best interest to, to be under someone or some organization or something. This morning, the, the question I want to ask, if we could kind of pivot almost 180 degrees, is what's worse than an authority that, that behaves or leads as though they're not under authority? Like, what's worse than an authority that, that functions as though they answer to no authority? Maybe you've heard the story of a father who owned a large manufacturing company, it was uh, created millions of dollars in annual revenues. And this father in his early 50s recognizes, recognized the need for a succession plan. And to his delight, his son, who was working in another organization, seemed to be qualified for the role. And so his company recruited his son to come work in his, in his own company. His son came to work and in most ways was, was uh, getting rave reviews. People loved him, save one thing. Uh, he had this tendency uh, to lose his temper. He had this tendency to, when he l lost his temper, to be rather abusive, kind of a verbally abusive boss. 
And so his father, when he was awakened to this reality, called his son into his office, and first he fed him a book, and that didn't seem to work. And a few months later, he actually, the, the company sent him to a conference about anger management, uh, another conference just about leading well, and that kind of worked. They even uh, created a budget line item, or a line item in their budget where they, could, where they were, started sending him to a professional therapist to kind of do the, the deep work of what, what is your problem and why are you so angry? Still, the, the, the returns were mixed. And so one day, this father... Uh, he had this very unenviable job where he called his son into his office and he said, son, as you know, uh, I, I wear a couple hats in your life. One is that of your boss and the other is that of your father. Son, I want you to know right now I'm taking my father hat off. I'm putting my boss hat on. And I want to tell you this is a yellow light conversation. And what I mean by that is if your behavior doesn't change, I'm going to have to fire you, son. Let's just be clear. And he went on to sign a, a piece of paper acknowledging that this is, had been communicated to him that if you lose your temper at, at, at someone that reports to you again, you're fired. And so they agreed, and I suppose every parent and leader and boss and owner can appreciate the, the heaviness of that moment. Everybody went back to their lives and their work, and a few weeks later, the father was just randomly walking through the offices, and there's a section of their offices where there were windows that overlooked the manufacturing facility, and he looked out the window, and, and there, sure enough, on the manufacturing floor was his son just clearly berating an employee. So the father, uh, he, he took a deep breath, he went back to his office, he collected himself, he called his son into his office. His son sat across from him. Everybody kind of seemed to be knowing what's going on. And the father again said, son, as you know, I wear a couple hats in your life right now. And right now I'm taking my father hat off. I'm putting my boss hat on. And I got to tell you, Alex, uh, you're fired. You can't work here anymore. You've got till noon and kind of went through that whole deal. And then he took motion like he was taking his hat off, set it on his desk, grabbed another hat, put it on his head and said, son, I heard you lost your job. I'm so sorry. How can I help you? <laughs> now, not only is that a brilliant illustration of what healthy boundaries look like, but it also kind of answers the question about what's worse than an authority that behaves as though they're not under authority. Because I think this, this father very astutely, wisely, he, he's, he's, he's decided there's nothing worse than an authority who behaves as though they're not under authority. And this father who loved his son and loved his company and loved his employees had long ago decided that his company wasn't going to be led by somebody who behaved as though they answered to no one. See, the question is, uh, like, what, when have you been abused? The, the reality is probably all of us have had this experience. We've all had that boss, maybe that parent, maybe that grandparent, that, that teacher, that, that lunchroom aide. Mine was Mrs. Weatherford. Isn't that funny how you remember those people, that, that playground? That, I think they have the toughest job in America, those who are like two people. Here's two of you. You're going to supervise two, 200 children that have been locked up for two hours. Sounds like a great job, doesn't it? Anyway, we, we, we've all had that coach, right? We've all been abused by power somewhere along the way, whether it was emotional, physical, sexual, even spiritual. I spend a lot of time talking to people who have been abused by spiritual authority, but the fact is, this morning, I don't want to talk about that boss or that coach or that pastor or that priest or that teacher. I don't want to talk about that parent. This morning, the pivot that I want to make is I want to talk about you and me. And I want to beg the question, uh, what, what's your authority style? Because as much as you're designed to be made under authority, and that's what we explored in the scriptures last week, you're also made for authority. And that's one of the tricky things about this conversation is, is you're made to be under it and you're made to have it. Now, Andy Crouch, and, and I think one of the best books I read in all of 20, 2014 in a book called Playing God, he says the, the real danger is if you allow yourself to just loathe authority, then what you're doing is you're dismissing the fact that you also have authority. Like you're a parent now. You're a spouse now. You're a leader now. You're an adult now. You have control and power and influence now. And the question becomes, how do you use it? Like, how do you use your authority? You know, and in some ways, I think the entire Christmas story and one of the challenges uh, that, that we have is every December, we, we, we get to revisit familiar stories and hopefully do them in such a way that you don't fall asleep. Just, just being honest. And one of, the, one of the things that stood out to me this, I suppose, this summer as we were looking ahead to Christmas is there's been this conversation rattling around in my head about authority for some time, recognizing my own issues with it, recognizing my own hesitancies uh, about it. 
And what stood out to me was the characters in the nativity, those stories that surround Jesus' birth, that, that it's, it's a case study in leadership style. It's a case study in this person, this person, this person, and this person. They all have authority, and they all exercised it differently. Like Herod, he had a style. Let's look at Matthew chapter 2, and, and we'll just kind of go into this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. We'll talk a little bit more about that in about 24 hours. Uh, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him when he had called together all the people. Oh, wait, sorry. I'm supposed to stop there. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. I wonder if it's safe to say that one of the best studies of authority is how you use it when yours is threatened. Like when you're a little broke and you have less financial authority, uh, when, when, there's, when there's a new organization that's competing with your organization, when there's a new employee and suddenly you feel less valued in the organization. Like I, I wonder if the reality is that, that when yours is threatened, that's when the character with which you use it is, is most evident. Herod was disturbed he was threatened. He'd been commissioned by Caesar to keep that portion of the world under control, and that seemed to be a little bit rocky right now, and he starts getting a little disturbed. And the question becomes, how, how do you behave when you're feeling jealous, threatened, uh, when it feels like your power is being stripped, when suddenly someone's valued more than you? See, for Herod, things got pretty dark, now, I warned you, or Caleb warned you, it's a little graphic. Here, here's the part that I wanted to show you. Here, here is one artist's uh, rendition of, of Herod and what he went through in, in this particular season. It's one of those pictures, the longer you stare at it, the darker it becomes. And I want to keep reading. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and iPod. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. And now here's where it does get pretty dark. When Herod realized he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave order to, orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. See, see one of the observations that, that occurs to me here is that simply, apparently Herod believed that, that God did not want him to possess authority. Herod had it. Jesus had it. And instantly Herod felt threatened. Apparently Herod lived his life with this kind of zero-sum game, believing that if one person has it, that means he doesn't. And if that person happens to be the Messiah, then that means God doesn't want him to have it. But I think a really important question is, is that accurate? Is it accurate to live as though God is threatened by your possessing authority? Uh, let's make that practical. Is it accurate to live that, like God is threatened if you have resource, if you have money, if you have health, if, you, if you're an American, if you live in America, is it, is it accurate to believe that, that God is somehow uh, against you having authority? See, here again, if we return to, to the whole narrative, we're reminded in Genesis 1, God creates people and he says, hey, uh, I'm going to make them in my image. Oh, yeah, what does that mean? It means I'm going to make them the vice president. Oh, yeah, what does that mean? It means they're going to have authority. It's like God, here's a crude analogy. God constructed this $5 million house with all kinds of amenities and then said, check you later, I'm leaving. We're going to leave these four five-year-olds in charge of the place and they can do whatever they want. Like God creates things and then he hands it over to people. And what we've explored a lot around here, uh, but I think is important to trip over over and over and over again, are, is that the scriptures, the God of the scriptures, the character of God in the scriptures is not one who doesn't want you to have authority. He, he's one who almost haphazardly gives it. If anything, you would fault him for, for so freely giving you authority. 
David one day was apparently reflecting in the sky, and I think every leader and adult and parent and person with a mortgage can, can appreciate what was happening here. David apparently looked at the sky and was like, God, I'm so little and so insignificant. My, like my life is just, boom, it, it's, it's gone. Perhaps he was looking at trees or something or the stars apparently that would be around much longer than him and he was just overwhelmed at the role he played. I had a moment like that this week where I did some tiling in my house and, and I was laying in bed that night and I had the weirdest, darkest, most honest thought. I thought, it's so weird. Like, some, that tile is, out gonna, is gonna outlive me. Like, some people are gonna own the house someday and they're not gonna know who I am and they're gonna enjoy the tile, or, or not. But, <laughs> right, I mean, this is, this, is, this is this weird reality of like all this responsibility and yet, like, the tree in your front yard lives longer than you do. But listen to the way David reflects on all this. It's in Psalm 8. It's, uh, I think, one of the most profound passages in, in all the Psalms. David says, When I consider your heavens, I look at the stars and the planets, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. I ask myself, what is mankind that you were mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and you put everything under their feet. What? What? God, why did you give us so much influence? All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and all the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the seas. See, what was the arrival of God, did that necessitate that Herod had to lose his authority? The answer is no. Instead, it's that, that there's a certain style that God partners with and there's one that he doesn't. See, see I, I wonder... I wonder if part of what happened to Herod here was, was if he lost sight of the goal. Now, we, we can only speculate here. I'm kind of stepping out of the page of Scripture. But, but I wonder if, if the way he desired authority when he was, say, 15 years old and the way he exercised it at this point in his life, I wonder if they were two different things. I wonder if his life had gone off the rails and the type of parent, the type of spouse, the type of leader, the type of boss he said he would be looked way different than what he was. The purposes for which he said he had power were getting played out in way different fashion than what he had originally committed himself to. Uh, This last spring, uh, my wife and the boys and I went to Missoula where my mom and stepdad live and and they're fairly active people, so they took us, they've been talking for a long time about this hike they like to take, which is on Waterworks Hill, which isn't quite Mount Helena, but is a little hilly, and I suppose it was four miles round t- trip, kind of probably on the longer end, and it was a warm, you know, warm day, and it wasn't strenuous, but it was, I mean, it was a four-mile hike, and we got done, and we, I think we, we grabbed sushi and kind of did that whole thing and came home a couple months later. Uh, we were in Missoula again, decided not to hike Waterworks Hill that time. A few weeks after that, I got a text from my mom saying, hey, uh, Sam's in the emergency room. We think there's something going on with his heart. Uh, that's weird. And just to kind of put it in context, he's in his 50s. He's a lifetime athlete, used to be a biker and climber, uh, is a blue collar, worked with his hands. I bet you he's not five pounds overweight. I mean, this is kind of the model of health as a 50-year-old. A couple hours later, got another text. Yeah, there's something with his heart. Next morning, uh, what they found out was that he had 99% blockage in, in one of his arteries, 95 in another artery, and needless to say, he wasn't going anywhere until they did quadruple bypass surgery uh, as an emer- kind of emergency surgery on a Sunday morning. And I still remember walking into his ER that Sunday afternoon. He'd just come out of surgery and, and looking at him and thinking to myself, this is so weird. Because this was all in him when we went on this hike. I mean, when you start piecing it all together, like, oh my gosh, that could have been terrible. And, and I'm so glad we didn't go on that hike when we were here just a, a little bit ago. And you start playing all those scenarios out in your head. Weird to think that, like, in this moment we're hiking, in the next moment he's got this condition. But the condition was always there. And my point is simply this. I, I wonder if, if Herod, I don't know if he was ignorant of or he lost sight of, that there's this thing in all of our DNA, this tendency to want power and authority and influence for ourselves and for our own benefit, for, for our own pleasure, for our own comfort. And it's not a Herod problem, it's a human problem. It's every story in the text. It kind of hovers on h- how do they handle uh, the, this thing inside of them. I, I read recently a, a, a more recent account of the 1986 Challenger space shuttle explosion. 
They say that on January 26th, the day before the launch, uh, an official from NASA called the, the chief engineers at the, the organization that manufactures the solid missiles that put the space shuttle into orbit. Morton Thaikal, I believe, was their name. Uh, this NASA official called them to ask them one very clear and important question. Can you prove that it's safe to launch the space shuttle tomorrow? Now, at issue was the fact that the space shuttle had never been launched in anything colder than like 54 degrees, and the forecast the next day in, in, in Florida called for low 20s. At best, it would be high 20s at the time of launch. They, they wanted to analyze with this 30-degree swing, uh, sh should, should that tell us something? Can you prove it's safe? So they were obviously hesitant to begin with. Morton Thaikal quickly uh, became concerned with a particular rubber-like O-ring within the missile, and that O-ring, of course, was designed to expand when it, uh, when it was faced with heat. That would keep these incredibly explosive gases from esca escaping, gases they knew would be catastrophic if they did escape. They began to talk much about these O-rings to the extent that they called a teleconference with NASA that evening, the evening of the 26th, a teleconference that lasted three hours. Interestingly, the teleconference began with NASA asking this question. Can you prove that it's unsafe to launch the space shuttle? Now, over the course of the last 20 or so years, uh, much has been said and many have suggested that NASA launched the space shuttle despite uh, the evidence. But this analysis I read said uh, much to the contrary. In fact, they said if, if it was so clear to everybody involved that, that it was okay to launch a space shuttle, why do you need a three-hour teleconference with some of the most brilliant science minds in all the world? They have recordings of, at times, NASA saying things like, when do you want us to launch this thing, in April? So yeah, there was some frustration, but they also have recordings of NASA saying things like, we're not going to launch this thing unless you tell us to. And one of the things at hand was that they had evidence that say these O-rings crack at 70 degree launches. And so what's to say that they're not going to crack at 20 and how, what's to say that's going to make any bit of a difference? But the analysis I read as it relates to how do you explain the disaster, it hovers around the fact that the conversation pivoted 180 degrees. That it started with, can you prove it's safe? The answer, of course, was no, we can't. And no NASA engineer, no young Ivy League uh, educated person, no Morton Thaikal company who was a million, worth millions and millions of dollars, nobody was going to stake their future on the guarantee that it was safe. The problem, they say, was the conversation pivoted from can you prove it's safe to can you prove it's unsafe. And that, they say, explains why they launched. My point is simply this. I wonder if, if Herod, as a 12-year-old boy, I thought someday I'm going to have power and influence and control, resource, and I'm going to use it for good. Like people will be glad that I have it. I, I will serve people with my power and influence. I wonder, I just wonder if everything pivoted for him. And like so many of us, like all of us are capable of and prone to, if it shifted from I would use it to serve to I'll use it for, for privilege. To, to an attitude that says leadership is a stewardship, it's temporary and you're accountable. To an attitude that says leadership is a right and I must claw and fight and do whatever I have to do to hold on to it. See, it's really easy, isn't it, to treat Herod as this dark lord? Not unlike the dark lord in Star Wars. And yet isn't even still the message the same in Star Wars? Listen, listen, listen. We, we can all flip the script and make the goal 180 degrees opposite. It's really easy to point a finger at your dad or your mom or that boss, that person, and in doing, never ask the question, what kind of dad are you? What kind of mom are you? What kind of boss are you? What, what, what's your authority style? Because you have it. I have it. Whether you're in fifth grade or you lead a billion-dollar company, you have it. The issue is, are you aware that you have it, and how, how do you use it? Andy Crouch, in that book that I've referenced that I like so much, he talks about a time where he was in India waiting to board a flight to Saudi Arabia. And when he showed up at the airport, he sh thought he showed up with plenty of time. And then he found himself in the back of a long line, one of those lines where you're wondering if you're going to miss the flight because the line's moving so slow. And he said it was kind of like something out of Groundhog's Day or some kind of bad movie because every person in front of him, about all 150 of them, were Indian men and they were all dressed the same way and they all had a briefcase in their hand. And he said he quickly figured out this was their routine. Every Sunday afternoon, they get on a flight, they fly to Saudi Arabia, they work there for the week, they fly home for the weekend. He stood in the back of this line, did, I suppose, what all of us do when we're afraid we're going to miss a flight. 
And then a few minutes in, five minutes in, he watched, he kind of strangely, he watched the, the, the booking agent walk out from behind the counter, walk the distance of these men, walk right up to him, do one of these numbers, like follow me. And he's like, listen, when somebody in India tells you to follow them, you just follow them in the airport, an official, like this is uh, the world we live in now in airports, right? And so he followed her to the counter. He handed her all her stuff, kind of uh, cooperated with what she was doing. Before he knew it, she'd punched his pass, and he was headed down uh, the, the corridor to get on the airplane. He said he wasn't until he was sitting on the airplane where he realized what had just happened. And he said, for the first time, it struck me, I have incredible power because I'm white. In that context, in that world, he, he realized he had just jumped 150 men just because of his skin color. See, that's a sociological uh, principle called mapping. Mapping says power's not bad. Power you don't know you have, that's what's dangerous. There's a story of an executive, a woman who was a chief executive in a company for over three decades. She she retired, took a a couple years off, decided to come back in a reduced capacity, was sitting in a a meeting in this company that she had led for decades. It felt to her like the meeting was over. She stood up to leave, and the new executive looked at her and said, what are you doing? She said, well, the meeting's over. And he said, the meeting's not over until I say it's over. And she realized for the first time that she'd been leading meetings for 30 years and was completely unaware of how much power she had because of the position she held. See, the question isn't, do you have authority? The question is, are you aware of the authority you have? Are you self-aware of the authority you have? And, And how do you use it? Herod had a style. The Magi had a style. And part of what Christmas does for us is it shows us God's style that Herod's style and God's style are way different from one another. The style of Herod is to protect and to use for privilege. The style of God may be made most evident in Genesis 12, when having first empowered people and then been betrayed by them, he says to Abram, Abram, I'll make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. Translation, Abram, I'm going to give you sick amounts of power and it's not for you. It's not for your benefit. It's for you to serve with. God and Herod, they do power completely differently. The baby in the manger and all that a newborn baby represents in terms of vulnerability and humility, that's the character of God. One day Jesus was hanging out with his guys and they were starting to jockey for position. One wanted to be the starting quarterback. One wanted to be the backup quarterback. One wanted to be like the the chief next guy, and the other one wanted to be the chief next guy. And Jesus was kind of sickened by it. And he said to him, Matthew 20, it's interesting, there aren't a lot of things that three of the four Gospels record. This is one of them. But in Matthew 20, Matthew records Jesus as saying, uh, he called them together and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. Who are we talking about? Talking about Herod. And their high officials exercise authority over them. What are we talking about? We're, We're talking about... Caesar, not so with you. In other words, we don't do power that way. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. See, we talk about being followers of Jesus, and probably many of you in this room would identify yourself as such, and sometimes that's this kind of ethereal, intellectual thing, like, oh, that means I do this on Sunday, or it means I have this on the wall, or I whatever. What if we said to be a follower of Jesus has everything to do with how we use our power? How we exercise the authority that we have? Is it for us? Is it for others? Are we servants? Or are we the end unto ourselves? How, how, who are you following in your exercise of power? And then Jesus offers himself as an alternative, a divine conspiracy, if you will, this completely different approach Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, the Christian story is there's this completely different way to approach power. And yet you can't willpower it to the surface. You can't white knuckle it. You can't make it happen. It requires the redemptive power of Christ alive in you and living, you living from the inside out. Let me ask you, how do you use your power? Not do you have it because you do. 
And maybe your worship, as we look ahead to Advent, which is all about waiting for Christmas Day, maybe for you, uh, the adventure is one of mapping your power, exploring where you have it, and then taking a long, hard look at how you use it. And if you're someone that's exploring Christ, to follow him is to believe that there's a completely different approach one modeled and made possible by him because of the cross, because of his death and resurrection. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.